Yes, history is here to help. And yes, we need help. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the uh, 12 o'clock block. I'm joined by my co-host and contributor, Peter Hoffenberg, a uh, history professor at UH. And we're talking today about affirmative action uh, because there's a case coming up in the Supreme Court. They, they agreed to take it. You know, they could have said no, but they agreed to take it. Um, and it uh, involves uh, what? Harvard and the uh, University of what? South Carolina. Um, all about affirmative action in those schools, but it goes far beyond that. And today we're going to talk about the history of affirmative action, what it means, where it fits in the context of the American experiment, um, and where it goes. Peter Hoffenberg, uh, welcome to the show, to your well, show, Peter. Good to see you. What questions do you have to start us off? Well, okay, first question, because I, I don't know if everybody fully understands what it is. What is affirmative action? Well, affirmative action has two definitions and two goals. Sometimes they're not consistent. Uh, sometimes they are consistent. One goal is affirmative action is to redress particularly historical uh, disabilities, and those include employment and education. And so it's an affirmation for usually a group uh, which has not had the same advantages. Uh, so you could see that the discussion, and I think we should probably keep our discussion reasonable and not ill-tempered. Uh, if I say that's what affirmative action is, then of course, one side says it's racism, uh, the other side says it's uh, structural racism, et cetera. So let's for us today think about it as trying to redress, like how can we redress where, as you said, the great experiment has failed. Can I add a second. nuance to that, Peter? Yeah, let me give you the second one and then let me add, let, add the nuance. The second one, because the nuance may also address what you say. Uh, the second one, and one that is equally commonly expressed, but was not the original intent of affirmative action, is that the goal of American institutions is to reflect the face of America and diversity in and of itself is a goal. And what we've seen in the conversation today is both, but particularly, uh, African-American historians and journalists remind us that initially this was not about the goodness of diversity. Initially, it was about redressing historical imbalance. So those are the two thrusts, right? Redressing historical imbalances, trying to make a fair playing field. And so we see equity, not equality. And perhaps one of the byproducts is seemingly something we always talk about, which is the significance of diversity and sociologists and psychologists say all institutions uh, are much healthier, make healthier decisions when there's dissent, when there's variety, when there's diversity. So I would introduce that as the two thrusts and arcs. Now let me have my uh, my point of digression uh, mm -hmm. related to the first one, um, and I would add to that this notion that uh, over time. Um, the way the country has worked is that certain racial groups have not had the same opportunities that you might have expected. And so this is catch up ball. This is let's give them the opportunities on an expedite. Let's, let's help them, incentivize them, create a pathway for them uh, to catch up and to have the opportunities retrospectively they might have otherwise had. And when I say that, I'm thinking about my own experience in the United States Coast Guard. When I got into the Coast Guard, which was October 1st, 1965, uh, it was really uh, an organization of mm, white men. Um, and it was uh, largely based in the South, perhaps even more than the Navy was. <clears throat> and uh, it, it involved families that had been involved, that had been members of the Coast Guard for generations from the same cities and towns. Same families over time. And, and one day, I guess it was under Lyndon Johnson, um, uh, the word came down from Washington that they were gonna directly commission a certain number of uh, African-American officers. Um, there weren't a lot of Af African-American officers in the United States Coast Guard at that time. And it was an edict that that's the way it's gonna be. Gentlemen, here are your colleagues, and they directly commissioned a whole bunch of them and spread them around the, the Coast Guard. And a really interesting aspect there was um, 
you know, um, these guys did not come from the same place as the rest of the officer corps in the Coast Guard. Um, and the Coast Guard is very, it's a very um, altruistic organization, a very patriotic organization. And at first, the worry was that they wouldn't accept these guys as their colleagues, as their, you know, fellow officers. But soon enough, it was clear they would accept them because it was in the national interest to do so. And so the whole thing worked pretty well. But I thought from my point of view to watch it happen, and I was there watching it happen, I thought mm, this is a catch up ball. Um, th they didn't have the, the numbers, the diversity they wanted. So let's create diversity right now in one day. And they did, and it worked. And it has worked since. That's my footnote to your comment. Oh, important footnote. Uh, and I, I know you well, so I know your strong ethical background and your strong moral base. But you see how the description about catching up when it becomes a political slogan, the next sentence is giving somebody an opportunity they may not deserve otherwise. And that's an incorrect, that's not your point of view, but you can see how what you just expressed. No, they um, were prevented. They were exactly. prevented by the institution, exactly. whether they so, were qualified or not. Exactly. It, it was not a question of qualification. It was just didn't have the opportunity. Right. And that's the conversation we need to have. So, you know, with affirmative action, the attack on Harvard is the understanding and the individual who's uh, bankrolling this and leading it. This is his second attempt. His previous legal attempt to attack affirmative action failed. And what he politically did, which was uh, quite canny of him, is make it a question of uh, Asian applicants, particularly East Asian applicants. So we're not talking about Filipinos or Burmese or, or probably Laotians. Uh, he understood that there was a movement in the United States, uh, particularly uh, among upwardly mobile East Asian immigrants and their families who felt they, that their position was being taken by an African-American. The implication being that the African-American only is taking that position because he or she or they are African-American. Are you saying that he really isn't talking about uh, Asians at all? He's really no, talking about African-American. This is an well, indirect way of attacking. Well, this, is a Trojan, this is a Trojan horse. Yes. Uh, he himself, I, and I don't want to speak for him, and, and certainly the Sarah Palin attack on the New York Times, I don't want to be charged with libel or slander. Uh, but I would say that he, had not, he himself and the architects had shown no interest in the Asian American community until recently when for his own effort. So this is not to deny what could be the gravitas of the effort, but we all know that cases arrive at the Supreme Court, whether we like it or not, with uh, the vapors of politics. There's a political trail behind them. Um, the case well, itself- it's, it's more than behind them, it's all around yeah, them. It's all around they, them. They, they are politicized. I don't think you'll disagree with me. And, when, and as Sotomayor would say, uh, it has a stench. The politics has a stench. Yes. And, and the stench is uh, a couple of things. That Harvard was chosen uh, to try to stoke the populist anti-elitist sentiment. Harvard's hardly the only university that includes race. Hardly the only one. They no, all it's all do, around the country. They all it? do in one way or another. So we have to look at, you know, why Harvard? <laughs> why Asian uh, students? And those all suggest to us about how affirmative action in this case is really being used politically for, I think we have to admit, some, uh, some rather unsavory, generally white, generally Christian, but not entirely, because there are Jews who have joined the anti-affirmative uh, launch as well. So for your audience, that's the case that the Supreme Court has agreed to take up and the nuts and bolts, as Toby Ziegler said, don't look too closely at a sausage, but the nuts and bolts for your audience are that in surveying applicants, uh, the uh, plaintiffs argue that personal characteristics, which allegedly East, uh, Asian immigrant, Asian American immigrants scored low on, were being used disproportionately to keep them from getting to Harvard. So their argument is essentially the notion of personal characteristics or social skills is really a racial category. Um, and so what they've done, of course, is they've called for the, the various surveys and emails, et cetera, about how students are ranked. But if your listeners are listening, that's kind of the nuts and bolts. You apply to Harvard, 
there's uh, what we call an algorithm these days, right? There's a column, and the column isn't just your test scores and your recommendation. The column includes some kind of uh, social interpretation. And the argument of the attorney and the plaintiffs is that social argumentation is biased and it's biased against, in this case, not necessarily white students, it's specifically biased against Asian American students. Now, I'm using Asian American. Uh, a lot of Harvard students are Asian from Asia. So I don't know actually the numbers, right? There are plenty of Harvard applicants from Malaysia and Japan and China. So I don't know, I haven't looked at the brief to see whether there's a difference between Asian American and Asian, but the racial category I presume would include both for the plaintiff. Well, that's, that's probably really more, than, more than you wanted to know, but I think it's good. No, it's but it's really flipping things on its head. Because um, uh, let, me, let me throw a proposition at you and see if you agree or disagree given your, your starting comments here. These guys are racist. No, I don't think they're, I do not think they're racists. Uh, what I think they are is what we might call racialist, which is that race is one of the components. They would be racist if, for example, uh, they took an African American who scored poorly on everything else just because he was an African American, only for that. Now that could be construed as racism. But racialist is a, and I, I think I would be. Well, I, I understand the distinction you're making, but when I when I and I ask you, uh, what pro, I propose to you, these guys are ra racists. I mean, the people who are mounting this lawsuit, the people who are taking this oh, case absolutely. against against Harvard and, and South Carolina, um, are racist. They want to keep African Americans out of those schools and any school. They want to deprive them of affirmative action. Um, they want they will make it harder for them to achieve opportunity. And it's not just African Americans. Um, I, I don't know what the the accepted term is, maybe at Latinx right now. But also, we want to remember that attacks on African Americans, while that gets the press, are also attacks on Native Americans who might be applying to Harvard, and also uh, Latino uh, Americans. So this is racist in the sense that it it is anti those groups, and if so facto, then. Unless those groups, of course, and look, this is this is the real world, right? Uh, not every African American applicant is poor, so they also include, you know, income and education, etc. But in general, you're right. If we look at this as a group issue, I don't think I don't think there's any doubt um, because their documents even say African Americans, for example, are allowed admission. Uh, because Asian Americans or Asians have scored poorly on this. No, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt. Now, whether Harvard's racist or not, uh, I think requires a lot more of a nuanced discussion. Um, they do, I, and that's why I use the term racial list in that, yeah, race is a category. It's a factor. I mean, it it, and, and it's, it's a factor for a reason. And it's a factor for, for, for I think, for both reasons, though. It's a factor because there are groups that have historically been obstructed from what the economists Sen would call the full liberation of their capabilities. The second reason is, like we're talking about Joe, uh, President Biden's appointment to the Supreme Court, maybe our institutions should begin to look like America. <laughs> and maybe yeah. looking like America, not just your national interest, but social inclusion. And as Cass Sustein and others have argued, any organization um, any organization that is interested in growth or interested in sincere discussion, any organization needs diversity. It needs yeah, well, and there are people in this country that oppose diversity, diversity in, any, in any shape or form, and, and they, they have emerged. But I want to go back to the history of it, because I think the history is very instructive. Now, my recollection, however shallow it may be, is that this, this whole notion of affirmative action did not exist prior to the 60s. And it came up in the 60s. It came up, as I mentioned, in my experience with the military. Um, and, I, and I don't think it existed before that. And, and then it, it sort of took, it took root around the country, around the educational institutions in the country. And within, I'm guessing here, 10 years or so, um, it was pretty much institutionalized. And a lot of schools had adopted affirmative action policies. The military certainly did. 
but a lot of companies, uh, a lot of institutions in the country had adopted it. And there was no great resistance. Everybody felt this was the right thing to do, the fair thing to do for the reasons you articulated. But the first reason you articulated, I think, was the stronger one. Um, that is redress and that, uh, and that with, was my, with my original. footnote about give them, giving them a, an opportunity to catch up. Um, so um, the question, I really, I put this question to you is, uh, how could that have happened? What were the forces in play that made affirmative action the issue of the day, that made affirmative action you know, get through the system and become the law? What was happening there? I, it's a wonderful uh, point um, question. Let me uh, just quickly address a couple of what you said and then talk a little bit more in general. Uh, first of all, there was resistance. Uh, you could look at Nixon's white Southern strategy as a resistance to affirmative action. So it was resistance in culture, it was resistance in local. So you had the advantage out of the goodness of your heart and being in an open institution. But there was a lot of resistance. and and much of that resistance we're seeing today. The second point is, I think you're absolutely right that affirmative action as we know of it was involved in the notions of the great society, the civil rights movement, and institutionalized in, in an office that Nixon finally executed, uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity, where affirmative action was in the White House and the White House oversaw it. Okay, now as a historian, I think you're absolutely right and we all know everything has some kind of precedent. So to me, a key precedent for American life is when Eleanor Roosevelt convinced Truman to integrate the army. And that could be looked at, and there was resistance, right? <laughs> there was resistance, but that could be looked at as a test case, particularly coming out of the Second World War, the quote unquote good war, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but we call it the good war, and that's another discussion for us. If you, if you win oh. the war, it's usually a, a good war. Well, that I agree with you. It's also a good war if clearly your opponent was so evil. <laughs> so, you know, that, you have it's, it's, an, it's an interesting discussion, and I would love to have it with you and your audience about, you know, what makes for a good war. But I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that coming out of World War II, right, there was much more confidence in America's mission. We talked about this before. Not that there was dissent, but America could be seen marching through the streets of Rome. A significant number of soldiers who didn't make it home were African-American. Truman, as historians remind us, uh, Truman was reluctant, but there was nobody with the force of nature in American history like Eleanor Roosevelt, maybe John Lewis, maybe Frederick Douglass. So I think the answer to your question is, yes, the 60s, but when Johnson and the Great Society sat down, they had a very powerful precedent. Now, what happened in the 60s, I think, um, legitimate historians will be wary of pointing to any particular uh, atom in the molecule. So let me give you a sense of the molecule, right? Let's put, us, put ourselves back, uh, probably after Kennedy's assassination. Johnson, uh, from a dirt poor background, there's all this discussion today about politicians making money. Yeah, he made money off of politics, but he also knew what it meant to be poor. And so his idea for affirmative action also included Appalachian kids, Appalachian families, uh, white Appalachians who had migrated to Chicago. So from the get-go, right, this was not only a black or white or Latino thing. This really was, you could almost say, a class issue. And there really, uh, there was not a significant black middle-class professionals. Those grew, certainly grew, but a lot of the pressure came from the realization that there was a large chunk of our society that, as Johnson said, had been left behind. Then, of course, let's not forget the direct action, right? People talk about disorder now. You and I are old enough to remember when Watts and Detroit and Trenton were all up in flames, right? Let's not forget the impulse of direct action towards this. And I think in this case, this was uh, pre-Nixon's white strategy. The, the face of white supremacy was Barry Goldwater. That was not a captivating face. You could just even compare uh, Trump's call to what Goldwater thought about. But remember, Goldwater was a highly educated, snobbish Jewish senator from Arizona. He was a John Bircher. 
uh, and clearly was out of step. But Nixon understood that parts of what Goldwater said were not out of step. Okay, that's a long-winded answer, but I it's think- a, It's another show, it's another discussion, right. but at, at that point, you, you had have to say the Republican Party um, was not the party of equality at all. The, the well, Republican Party was looking to divide uh, and looking to um, uh, to, to make to make a class a class society and a racist society. Yeah, I think there were plenty of Democrats as well, though. You know, the Dixiecrats. So Johnson's brilliance um, was uh, using the bully pulpit and combining that. Uh, as a historian, I probably am uh, <laughs> too self congratulatory. Uh, the important publication of Michael Harrington's The Other America. You know, we historians always look at key books, right? It's hard to understand Mao without his letter, Little Red Book. It's really hard to understand the French Revolution without Rousseau. I don't think any historian would take an exacto knife and remove this book. This book was reviewed, commented upon, read by people at the White House. And sometimes, right, it takes that, that synergy with, let's remember though, a society who's willing to go beyond the 15 second social media prompt. You open this book and still so much resonates, but it was not a particularly black or white book. It said the poor are being left behind. So Nixon's strategy was the old Confederate strategy. You're poor and white, but you're really so much better off because you're white, you're not black. And that helps crush uh, LBJ's really rather, uh, look, let's be honest, I mean, LBJ would not have let his daughter marry a black man. We know that, okay. Um, but that doesn't mean that he did not see both the moral and political advantages. What he did say, though, remember, is when he signed the Voting Rights Act, he turned the pen to Martin Luther King Jr. and said, I just signed over the South to the Republicans. So what we're seeing today is really, and we see that in the seeds of the early resistance to the great society. Okay, so I, I make a comparison between affirmative action and, and maybe, if you will, and I'm making an assumption about what our um, <clears throat> politicized the Supreme Court's going to do in that case. But Roe v. Wade, it met resistance. The resistance grew over the past how many years, decades? <clears throat> and then resistance was so well organized that it, it ultimately now is to the point where they will destroy Roe v. Wade. Uh, and I make a parallel, see if you agree, affirmative action. Uh, the resistance was there, it grew. Um, and now we're gonna have this case from the Supreme Court and they're gonna do away with affirmative action in the same way, the country's turning right uh, on both of those issues. And it's the same process, isn't it? I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think in this case, uh, you can you can take uh, a GPS view, and you could see the 30-year effort of the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society vets uh, judges throughout the federal system, and the Federalist Society uh, has a particular ideological view connected to their particular uh, constitutional view. And I think in their minds, uh, affirmative action probably violates the 14th Amendment in the sense that for them, affirmative action does not give equal legal opportunity and equal legal protection. I think you're right. Um, I think it's gonna be very difficult for, uh, Roberts um, clearly has no interest in the Voting Rights Act. He's been at the lead of destroying the Voting Rights Act. I'm not sure where he leans as far as the precedent which says, right, you can use race. I mean, Bakke said, you can use race. It just can't be the only thing. He has a slightly different view about precedent, but I think with the 6-3, it doesn't really matter, right? Because it's 5-4. We've seen that, that Roberts can hide, hide himself and take, take a position which is with uh, Sotomayor, uh, Kagan, um, and Breyer. I think, I think you're, I'm sorry? Well, Breyer. Not, Breyer, not Breyer anymore though, but right, Breyer will be well, just Soon be enough, Breyer's successor, right. yeah. Right, so no, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I think that again, it's a consideration of some uh, major aspects of, of the great society and doesn't just include women's rights, which are part of that. It's going to include uh, unleashing the freedom of religion. So anything that's seen to violate freedom of religion, including masks, <laughs> will be thrown out. Uh, it's going to destroy entirely the Voting Rights Act. I think we can see from the decision yesterday or 
two days ago. Yeah. And these are all parts, right, these are parts of the great society. LBJ was no great feminist, but let's remember uh, the feminist movement began in the late 60s and 70s as saying, look, the great society needs also to include us, as then the gay and lesbian community did. And the other issue, I think, and here we really got to look at Amy Coney Bear and Alito. They have a religious interpretation. It's not just an originalist position. It's a religious interpretation. And I think the founding fathers and mothers would be quite concerned uh, when religion is interpreted by the highest court, freed up by the Constitution. You're really beginning to uh, at least challenge the Second Amendment. <laughs> you're beginning to say, right, that religion is of the ultimate importance. And it's never really individual religion, right? Uh, it's not my right to be a pagan. I'll gladly, you know, it's, I would gladly uh, build Stonehenge outside my house, but that's not what's gonna be defended. I doubt that Islamic practices or Muslim practices, we're really talking about a Christian view of America, but a Christian right. view, a Christian view which is not just part of society as in 50 churches up and down Nuwanu, exactly what the founding fathers did not want, which is religion integrated into the structure of government and into the state. But that's where we're going. We are going. It's a, it's a faith-based nation, according to uh, W. Bush. And uh, it's been going that way for a long time. But, right, but back, to, back to affirmative right. action. I, mm -hmm. but I wanted to know from you, let's assume for this discussion, I, it's a reasonable assumption, um, that you know, the, the Supreme Court knocks off affirmative action mm -hmm. or modifies, you know, pulls right. the wings out of it in some way. And they can make it sound like it's a, you know, somewhere in the middle. But in fact, if you attack it, everybody runs away from it. So I, and that's my question. What will happen? What will happen on the college campuses? For example, you're on a committee, uh, you're an administrator, mm -hmm. you want to you know, handle a, um, you know, um, an application. Uh, and you see this person is African-American. And the rules had to change because the Supreme Court pulled the wings out of affirmative action. Are, are you going to wind up giving this individual special consideration, even though that's not the law anymore, simply on your view of finding a diversity in the campus, finding a diversity in the country? Because, you know, if, 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 if an African-American in numbers, right, in, in a sort of a demographic way, gets to go to good schools, get to go to school in general, then the next generation is going to be better off and better off and better off. And that's what's happened. Uh, for, I believe the affirmative action has had a huge effect on the country. It has been successful in many ways to raise up, you know, um, racial groups that wouldn't have had those opportunities. So <clears throat> my question is, how does, it, how does it differ if I pull the wings out of that, if the Supreme Court just trounces it or somehow neutralizes it? Um, what's it going to be like for an administrator? What's it going to be like for the schools? What's it going to be like for the country? Okay, as far as uh, college level, I think we need to differentiate between uh, elite private colleges. And I don't mean elite in a pejorative way. I mean elite that selects uh, versus public universities. So this is, as I said, deliberately aimed at Harvard. <laughs> okay, but I think the University of Chicago and the Stanford and the Harvard and the Yale and the Princeton admissions committees are gonna select the same people. They're gonna find other categories which in one way or another don't butt heads with the decision coming up about Harvard. And they, they will find ways. Um, I worry more about the other universities. And in America, you know, really unlike any other society, again, good or bad, we do encourage people to go to college. <laughs> Most societies have a track, right? You don't go to college. And if you go to college, you go to technical college. That's pretty much the world. So what we're really talking about is how is it going to affect a majority of African Americans and a majority of age, you know, a majority of Asian Americans don't go to Harvard. <laughs> you know, they go to UCLA, they go to Chicago State. So I can't tell you because I don't know what the local political pressures are going to be on. You know, we've seen school boards getting attacked. Are we going to find parents, you know, screaming outside of college admissions offices? I don't think so, but I think probably those of the vast middle 
which serve an incredibly important, I mean, UH is in the vast middle, but we serve an important purpose here, right? I mean, where else are you going to go to go to a university in the state with graduate students to get a PhD? So we're, I, I assume we're not gonna pay very much attention <laughs> because we have, we have a public obligation in the state of Hawaii to include everybody who is worthy of going to this? Well, we, we're special yeah. on diversity. Right. We're unique on. There's no state that is quite as diverse right. as. But we I are. think there are other states that are in the same position, where they're not the elite university, but they're the state where the parents might not have gone to college, and suddenly the kids get an opportunity. And I think those are going to be put in a difficult political position if their legislators give them the money, and if their legislators have taken this the way that they've taken the book boycott. So I can't really predict. Milner could probably predict better than I can politically. But the quick answer to you is the elite of the elites are going to find other ways to make sure that affirmative action reaches out to people who have been historically disadvantaged and reaches out in a way which says that this graduating class or this graduate cohort looks a lot better like America than it did 25 years ago. Well, yeah, so but, think, you know, but then the you're going to have people who will attack that. Absolutely. Who will come and say that de facto, they're still doing affirmative action, even though the Supreme Court knocked it off. Um, and they'll sue those schools where they can find it, prove it. Um, and then before you know, we'll be in court again. Right. And uh, that'll be very intimidating to the schools. Um, Harvard won't be intimidated. Uh, but again, a public, a public university might not have the resources to go to court. You're absolutely right. A uh, well, public and, university in a Republican state. How about that? Right. Although, yeah, either that or even, you know, we're, the UH is taking some big hits from the legislature. I'm not even sure we can go to court uh, to defend UH. But I think one of the issues looking down the road is uh, while respecting the position of the, of the African-American community, the largest number that this is going to affect are Latino Americans. That's a growing population. And if this is a white slash Asian uh, attempt, then it's, as I said at the start, it's not just African Americans, but really a very growing uh, part of our community, which are, uh, as they say, Latin America, not really including Filipinos here, uh, but uh, from what we know, you know, below the Rio Grande. What do you do about Mexicans and Costa Ricans who come to America? become citizens or their kids, this is gonna affect them, them as well. So it's not just, you know, it's like Whoopi Goldberg tried to make everything a black white issue. It's not just a black white issue. <laughs> this is that we are maybe next to, you know, India or Brazil, really the most diverse society. And being diverse, how, how do we take that diversity, not as a way to, you know, exclude people, but to include people. And if you're gonna to say to everybody, well, going to college is important for inclusion, then you're gonna to have to make college open, right? It's easier in an elite society. If you're in an elite society, it says college is just for the elite. This is not an issue. But if you believe in democracy and you believe in education as a democratic right and opportunity, yeah, this is very much an issue. Well, you anticipate my, my next question, you know, that is to, assuming that uh, there is pressure on a number of schools and you talk about the, you know, the demographics. So Harvard only has a certain number of students and they have the ability to resist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an attempt to, to cram down the lack of affirmative action. Other schools won't have that ability and they will abide by the withdrawal of affirmative action, but the Supreme Court. And, and then when you take, you know, the numbers in general, uh, the student body in general around the country over time, this will have an effect on the country because there won't be as much diversity in, in the colleges, period. There won't be. And then when you take it on, on, on top of, uh, you know, Biden's um, effort to make uh, free tuition, you know, uh, that's probably going to fail. Uh, Republicans are not going to pass that. So what you have is a, is a, is a kind of uh, an effort by the Republicans and the supremacists, the conservatives and all that, to separate uh, black and brown uh, students from higher education. I mean, it's, it's kind of part of their unwritten um, agenda. Uh, maybe it's more than unwritten. Um, yeah, and over time, over right. time, as a historian, um, you would have to have a reaction to that.
that that is going to change the country. Um, how is it going to change the country? Is it going to is it going to put people in the street with direct action? Um, is it going to change the the politics? I know Neil could answer. Neil Miller could answer that, but so can you. Um, is it going to change the way we function as a democracy? I think it already is in some ways. But this seems to me a very important issue. So it's not only what the Supreme Court does and other things. It's this one that casts a long shadow. What will that shadow be? Again, I'm not sure how much time we have. Uh, one, of the, one of the shadows is most statistical studies suggest that if you complete a college degree, you will make more lifetime income, which means the possibility of purchasing a home. So direct answer to you is restricting college admissions can be directly tracked to racial and ethnic economic inequality. And I don't really think anybody disagrees with that. The number of African-American homeowners is generally connected to their educational level. And you can begin to say the same things about Latinos. So one quick answer is it's going to make economic inequality worse. Its political implications I would say uh, there will be student movements. There are student movements. Um, I can't tell you, and again, Milner can tell you much better uh, how that will be translated. I think it's connected, to answer your question, with the increasingly restrictive voting laws, right? <laughs> if you have a large number of non-white, uh, non-Asian American, although Asian Americans, believe me, are not fully behind this lawsuit. so. The, the plaintiffs would like to think that they're representing, you know, all of Asian America, but they're not. There are plenty of Asian Americans and, and important Asian, Asian American figures who still abide by it from an action. So um, this is really a, a white, you know, it's a white movement trying to use uh, the Trojan horse of, of Amer Asian Americans. But the question would be, all right, you're angry, you want to get on the streets, but you also recognize that, that if you want change, you're going to have to go through voting <laughs> and get your representatives in office. All right, now, as Mill and everybody knows, it's not so simple, but you can't really do anything unless you get people into office. So if you take the attack on affirmative action and the attack on voting, you can see how they're happily married, right? The people who are going to be most hurt by ending affirmative action, ah, interesting enough, we're making it more difficult for them to vote, right? It doesn't take, a nuclear scientist <laughs> to see. Oh, I think I think they're yeah. all connected. They are connected. And they lead to a significantly different country than we would have if we didn't have the, the initiatives of uh, undermining voting and undermining black and brown education. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's those are two pillars of <clears throat> at least uh, the ideas of American democracy. I mean, I think we all appreciate the experiment, but the idea is one person, one vote to be protected. That's being undermined. And at least since the, well, I would say probably again, <clears throat> interesting enough, the GI Bill. You know, we talked about the integration of the Army. The GI Bill also helped say to America, right, that you should have the opportunity for an education. So I know that was reserved to GIs, but the idea, and, and we know that GI Bill was actually not distributed equally. African American GIs got far less. But you know, once you put it out there, it does have a life of its own. Yeah. And so as I suggested, integrating the army was important for civil rights and for action. The GI Bill was also a claim that, you know what? You're here in America, it's your democratic right to have an education. And then so that, that connects up with what you were talking before about um, marching through Italy. It connects up with uh, the, you know, the moral uh, vision that the United States had after the war. And it lasted for a while. Um, it lasted until Vietnam kind of eroded it. But, um, you know, in my view, but um, all I can say is uh, you, you haven't made me feel better today, Peter. I, I wish you had. I always look right. for that. I don't, I don't feel very good either. You know? I don't feel any better. <laughs> I'm not sleeping at all. And we haven't even gotten to this, the third aspect of the unholy trinity, that the court is also going to make it easier to have guns. So put all yeah. these together, right? Yeah. Less education, less voting, more anger, uh, a white community in some places thinking it's besieged and it's right to defend itself, and now everybody gets to carry guns. 
Well, so let me you say, really, you really want to lose your sleep. Think about that. They should be losing their sleep, those judges, but they're not. They you know, they're not. Um, and that's a conversation I'd be happy to have again with Avi, who knows more about the Supreme Court. Uh, they're really not, um, in part because they aren't doing what judges really are supposed to do. You're supposed to weigh, right? You're supposed to weigh, and you're supposed to find some kind of working compromise. Well, That's at not. the end, law must follow morality. If you lose your moral compass, um, you know, it's not a good result. We well, got to go now, Peter. Okay, we have to go to continue, uh, as always. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, my, my pleasure. All right. Aloha. Aloha.